Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday rundown of all the latest and greatest news relating to everything aerospace, spaceflight, and space history. Today's episode will take us all over the globe, from the sunny shores of California, to the beautiful coasts of New Zealand, to the mountains of China, and to the east coast of India. Lots to unpack there, so let's launch right into the news. But before we do, do make sure you hit the subscribe button down below. Most of you aren't, it seems and by subscribing you can ensure that you get notified of these videos the instant they come out so that your news is as up-to-date and relevant as possible. But with that, it's time to transition over to the first segment of our show, all the launches that happened last week. Last week we had three rocket launches as well as some great progress being made to SpaceX's Starship, so let's talk about that now. The first launch last week took place on Monday the 26th, when China launched a Long March 2C rocket from the Zichang Launch Center. The main payload was three Yaogan reconnaissance satellites, but in addition to these was also a Tianqi-6 satellite for the Internet of Things communications. Our second launch took place a couple of days later, on the 28th of October, in slightly less secretive circumstances on the sunny coast of the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand. Yes, it was Rocket Lab's successful launch of their Electron Rocket In Focus mission. The mission's nickname was derived from the nature of its payload, an Earth Imaging Microsatellite for Canon Electronics, and nine SuperDove Earth Imaging Nanosatellites for Planet Labs. I always love watching Electron Rockets launch, and this, Rocket Lab's 15th flight of their vehicle, was no exception. I think it's just the combination of the incredible scenery and the sleek design of the Electron itself that really ties it all together. The rocket is called Electron due to its Rutherford engines, which are the first electric pump-fed engines to power an orbital-class rocket. While it's currently an expendable launch system, Rocket Lab has stated that they hope to one day be able to recover the first stage using a mid-air catch from a helicopter, which is pretty epic if you ask me. Rocket Lab have already demonstrated their mid-air catch capabilities with this test flight that you can see on screen, and if they ever decide to go ahead with full implementation of this system, then I can't wait to to see it happen for real. Our third and final launch from last week was the suborbital flight of a Minuteman 3 missile. The vehicle was equipped with a test re-entry vehicle and was launched in the early hours of October 29th from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. Worry not, it's not a sign that war were declared. This was a simple test flight of the vehicle in order to demonstrate that the missile is safe, secure and effective. Officials have stressed that the test was planned very far in advance and was not in response to current events, that such test launches are used to verify the accuracy and reliability of the ICBM weapon system and provide valuable data. It also means we got to see this really cool video of the silo door opening and the rocket flying out. Epic stuff. And that's all the launches that took place last week, so now it's time to take our scheduled meander down to Boca Chica, Texas, to take a look at how the Starship is doing. The SN8 is still standing proud in the Texas skyline and is currently awaiting its nose cone cryoproofing tests, which according to road closures look to take place over the next few days. There's also the matter of its next static fire test. At the time of me writing the script for this episode, November the 1st, it hasn't happened yet, but by the time you're watching this video it may have already taken place. Let me know down below if it has. What is the future like, by the way? Do we have jetpacks yet? Anyway, this second static fire test of the vehicle's three Raptor engines differs from the first, as this time the engines will be fed from the header tanks of the vehicle rather than from the main tanks. These header tanks hold the fuel required for the Starship to perform its landing burn and aren't used for the main launch process. As you can imagine, it's important to make sure these all work correctly, as if not, the SN8 might hit the ground a little too hard when it performs its 15km test flight. No word on when this 15km flight will be taking place unfortunately, but hopefully it'll be sooner rather than later. Honestly, the only reason I even mention it is because I'll take any excuse I get to show off Corey of Seabass Productions' awesome render of how this flight will look. Check out his Twitter via the on-screen credentials if you want to see more. To rapidly run down the other Starship prototypes, SN9, 10, 11 and 12 are all being actively worked on and components for the SN14 have been spotted at the Boca Chica site. Presumably this means there's an SN13 somewhere, although there's still no visual confirmation of the vehicle's existence. Perhaps SpaceX are superstitious and are skipping the 13th serial number. As for Super Heavy 1, barrel and dome sections continue to be worked on and the massive high bay continues to near completion. 
look carefully at the metal framework at the top of the building. That will be a glass-sided bar offering panoramic views across the Boca Chica landscape. Personally, not naming it the Space Bar will be a real missed opportunity, but if you have a better idea for what this venue could be called, then I'd love to hear your thoughts down below. And hey, if you're enjoying the video so far, then do hit that like button as well. It's always very much appreciated. But now, my friends, it's time to move along to the next segment of the show, all the launches that we anticipate to see over the next seven days. Our first launch this week will be an Atlas V, carrying an NROL 101 reconnaissance satellite for the US National Reconnaissance Office. Currently, weather is 80% go for the launch on the 3rd of November from Cape Canaveral. While the payload is naturally classified and therefore there's not a great deal to talk about with that, the rocket itself will be boosted with a new kind of solid rocket motor, the GEM-63, which was developed as a drop-in replacement for the AJ-60A booster used on the Atlas V until the NROL 101 launch. The next launch in our calendar will take place on the 5th of November, which will see a Falcon 9 carrying a GPS-3 satellite for the US Air Force. This was previously due to fly on October the 2nd, but was scrubbed a painful two seconds before launch. SpaceX have fixed the issue and completed a static fire test of the rocket, so everything is looking favourable for a successful second attempt on Thursday. Falcon 9s are pretty reliable machines, so I am hopeful that we should definitely see it take to the skies this time around around. Our next flight is on the same day, and it's a fairly big one. It's the maiden flight of a brand new launch vehicle, Galactic Energy's Ceres-1 rocket. The payload has yet to be officially announced, but being the maiden voyage of the Ceres, it may simply be a dummy cargo. The Ceres-1 looks very Electron-esque in design, but this is only surface level, as the rocket consists of three solid fuel stages to get into space, topped with a very small liquid fuel stage for orbital insertion. Being comprised of most Mostly solid fuel stages, this makes the Ceres 1 fairly similar to a firework, rather fitting then that it's planned to launch on bonfire night. The rocket can place up to 350 kilograms into low Earth orbit, a smidge more than the 300 kilograms that the Electron is capable of, but of course, the Chinese firm Ceres 1 has yet to prove its flight capableness, but hopefully we'll see it soar successfully on Thursday. At the very least, the firm use a Tiger to show how big their fairing capacity is, and I think this could potentially be a good standard that the whole space industry could adopt. The next day, on November the 6th, China planned to launch another rocket, this time a Long March 6, carrying 10 new sat satellites for Argentina. You may remember us talking about this on previous episodes, as it's unfortunately been delayed a couple of times, but here's hoping this week will be a success. Our final anticipated launch will be from India's Satish Dhawan Launch Center and will be the flight of a Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, or just PSLV, rocket on the 7th of November. The rocket will head to low Earth orbit, carrying an Indian reconnaissance satellite, four navigation satellites for Luxembourg, four Earth observation satellites for American firm Spire Global, and a Lithuanian technology demonstration satellite. It has been a while since India last launched a rocket, and so it's great to see them back on form. The PSLV is definitely one of my favourite looking launch vehicles, and the launch complex from which it departs is certainly a pretty place as well. Godspeed, PSLV. And now it's time for this week's Delta IV Heavy Update. Still isn't launched yet. No word on when it will. And that has been this week's Delta IV Heavy Update. And those are pretty much all of the launches we're expecting to see over the next few days. So now it's time to segue over to our final chapter in this week's episode, a wander down the fascinating road of spaceflight history, where we'll take a look at all of the historic spaceflight anniversaries set to take place over the next seven days. We begin this week's history segment with two big anniversaries. Tomorrow, November the 3rd, marks the anniversary of both the 1974 launch of the NASA Mariner 10 spacecraft and also the 1957 launch of Sputnik 2. Sputnik 2, of course, needs barely any introduction on this channel. It was not only the second ever spacecraft to launch into Earth orbit, but it was also the first ever to carry a living animal, the Soviet space 
Space Dog Laika. The Sputnik 2 capsule was launched from the Baikonur Cosmodrome aboard a Sputnik 8K71PS rocket with a mission of providing scientists with data on the behaviour of a living organism in the space environment, as well as equipment for measuring cosmic rays and solar radiation. Sadly, the capsule wasn't designed to return to Earth and Laika died on the fourth orbit from overheating due to an air conditioning malfunction. On slightly happier news though, no dogs were harmed in the flight of Mariner 10, which took flight on November the 3rd in 1974. It was launched from Cape Canaveral aboard an Atlas Centaur rocket, and it would go on to become the first spacecraft to make use of an interplanetary gravitational slingshot manoeuvre, whooshing past Venus to lower its perihelion to the level of Mercury's orbit. This allowed the spacecraft to encounter Mercury three times in 1974 and 1975, and in doing so it became the the first spacecraft to encounter Mercury. It didn't have the necessary fuel reserves to slow down to orbit the toasty little planet, but it was still able to conduct a variety of experiments, including study of Mercury's surface and physical characteristics, revealing Mercury to have a moon-like surface. It also discovered that Mercury has an atmosphere, albeit a tenuous one, comprised mostly of helium. On November the 5th, we'll see the anniversary of the successful lunar orbit of Chang'e 1. China's first lunar satellite, which was launched aboard a Long March 3 on the 24th of October. It provided data to create an accurate and high-resolution 3D map of the lunar surface and was deorbited and crashed into the moon on March 2009. Also on November the 5th, we have another Asian spaceflight anniversary, this time coming from India in 2013, when the country launched the Mars Orbiter mission. Its first interplanetary probe aboard a polar satellite launch vehicle XL from the Satish Dhawan Space Centre. The spacecraft reached Mars around a year later, making India the first Asian nation to reach Martian orbit and the first nation in the world to do so on its first attempt and the fourth space agency to reach Mars overall, after Roscosmos, NASA and the European Space Agency. Our next anniversary is the 1996 launch of NASA's Mars Global Surveyor, which we'll be able to celebrate on the 7th of November. The spacecraft took flight aboard a Delta II rocket and it became the first successful mission to the Red Planet in 20 years. The mission studied the entire Martian surface, atmosphere and interior over several years, operating in Martian orbit from 1997 to 2006. By studying Mars for several Martian years, the Mars Global Surveyor has observed gully formation, new boulder tracks, recently formed impact craters and diminishing amounts of carbon dioxide ice within the southern polar cap. Sadly, on the 2nd of November in 2006, the spacecraft failed to respond to messages and commands and all attempts to recontact failed and NASA officially terminated the mission in January 2007. As a bonus not really related to spaceflight anniversary, today, on November the 2nd, we saw the first and only flight of the Hughes H4 Hercules, also known as the Spruce Goose, in 1947, which at the time was the largest fixed-wing aircraft ever built. It earned its nickname from the fact that it was made from wood, because of wartime restrictions on the use of aluminium, though it was primarily made from birch. It remains the largest single fuselage aircraft by wingspan to this day, and it's on display at the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon in the USA. I tacked this on at the end of our history segment as it's not really spaceflight related, but it's still a pretty nifty vehicle that I thought viewers of this channel might appreciate. But that about wraps up all of the coolest spaceflight anniversaries that are set to take place over the next few days. Let me know which one you found the most interesting down below, or you know, let me know if I missed anything, as I always love reading about how far we've come from the wobbly first flying machines to the mighty Saturn Vs. <laughs> And with that, another week has elapsed. My, doesn't time fly. Unlike the Delta IV Heavy. Ha 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 ha, I'm just messing with you, ULA. Take all the time you need to get that thing airborne. Rocket science is tough, and we'd all prefer to see a delayed launch over an explosion, I'm sure. Everyone, thank you all so much for watching this week's episode of Space This Week, and I look forward to seeing you next Monday. There's an end screen in front of you now. If you want to see more videos like this one, then check out the full playlist on the left, or if you're feeling adventurous, then click on the one on the right, which was generated by YouTube's algorithm based on your viewing habits. Goodbye!